Hello everyone and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're happy you could join us for another hour of answering your landscape questions. If you'd like to contact us, please dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Toll free number is 800-676-5446. Pictures and emails for future shows can be sent to byf at unl.edu. We do need to know as much information as you can give us, including where you live, and send us really good pictures, please. Be sure to check us out on our social media websites like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. All right, Dennis, bring up the bag. Oh, I didn't know I needed a bag. So it's one of the most wonderful times of the year when <laughs> garter snakes, our first snake to give live birth, um, is giving birth this week and next week across the state. And I just happen to be, this is not a newborn garter snake, um, but it's of a three-year-old and it was found right near NET here at 33rd and Holdridge. And it's something we see a lot with garter snakes. It's a genetic aberration. Uh, it's a melanistic, which means it has no melanophores. So it just has the xanthophores and the iditophores, so it's white and yellow. And as you can see, this little guy has a brilliant color on the, down the back and it has uh, cream on the side. Um, but again, so you'll see a lot of these. And so any small snake you found before now had to be born last year. Now, unfortunately, snakes have 90% mortality in the first year of life, and most of them don't make it. And this one probably would have had a harder time making it, but we found it last year uh, when it was very small. And so since it's in the lab, it's able to make it, uh, but again, and now our other snakes, they'll hatch out in September with our rattlesnakes uh, having live birth in the end of September. So if people see a garter snake, they should let it be, right? Oh yeah, let it be, just like <laughs> Paul McCartney said. <laughs> let it be, because they carry no germs and viruses, their teeth are less than an eighth of an inch, and they eat the insects and earthworms. Yeah, excellent. If you don't like spiders, keep the snakes around. Yeah. But you can go running really fast in that opposite direction. <laughs> if yeah. you don't like the snake. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, are you climbing into John's lap over I'm there? I'm trying to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <That's not laughs> <a pathology. laughs> okay, thanks, Dennis. All right, Matt, you brought half the yeah. pasture with yeah, you. Yeah, mine's not as cool as a snake, but a lot of people don't like them. Uh, so uh, the first one I have here is large crabgrass. And as you can see, this one was growing in an unmowed area, and it's almost two feet tall. So if you let it go, it'll grow. If you mow it, it's still gonna grow. And you get these nice seed heads on it. So if you have a small lawn and you don't want a bunch of crabgrass next year, uh, odds are you can pull this out because uh, you're really not gonna do much to kill it now. Uh, there's really no herbicides that do a really good job once it's this big, unless you're spot spraying with Roundup. Um, same with foxtail. Uh, there's a lot of seed on here. And if we pull it before it all drops, this one's already starting to mature and the seeds are all gonna fall off. So it's basically setting you up for next year to have a bunch of foxtail and crabgrass. Uh, so I just did this in my lawn. I had a couple growing around, um, around the house and I just pulled them out and I threw them away. That way the seed's gone and it's not there for next year. Um, so if you don't have a ton of them, it's, it's doable and it's, it's a way to do it without a herbicide because I've tried killing foxtail with herbicides at this stage and it's impossible. Awesome. Because the seed's there, it's still going to drop. All right. But well, where do you th where do you throw it away? Because you can't put it in your compost, compost can right. you? Or you can't. I wouldn't it. put it in your compost. I mean, if it's just small amounts, I would throw them in your trash can. The same thing what you're doing with your other trash, because it's mm -hmm. it pretty much dries down and shrivels up to nothing anyway, as long as it's not big piles of it. All right. Thanks. Yep. Okay, Kyle. This is not a good thing. No. So. Can be ready for some more hosta questions, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But here I have hosta virus X. Um, one of the, a, a disease that everybody thinks their hostas have, most of them actually don't have it. So I've tested probably a hundred different hostas for this virus in my life, and this is the first one to actually come back negative or come back positive for the virus. And one of the um, key characteristics of Hosta virus X is it looks different. 
So <laughs> that can be really difficult depending on the type of hosta that you have out there. Um, but a lot of the natural variegation that we have with hostas, that can be similar to hosta virus X. But with this one, one of the things that I want to kind of show is, one, there's really no symmetry um, between the two sides. And so here on the bottom, the leaf is still all nice and green where up at the top part of the leaf, we do have a lot more of that bright green coloration that we're seeing too. And so that's kind of a sign that, okay, the coloration isn't, isn't quite right. The other thing is this leaf is pretty crinkly and kind of stippled. Um, so it kind of feels a little bit leathery. That's another key characteristic of, of most viruses. Granted, this one also has some slug feeding and some other insect damage too, but when we are seeing this leaky coloration um, or just abnormal looking hostas, that is a sign that maybe you have hosta virus X. And as far as control, this is going to be one that you'll just want to uh, remove that entire plant. And so not only the, the above ground portion of the plant, but also the root system, because that virus can survive in the root system. And so if you are kind of lazy and just go and cut it at, at ground level, that virus will, will remain in the soil next time you plant a hosta there. All right, but you could plant another hosta you in You could the plant spot. another hosta in the spot. I would, I would make sure that you're digging up uh, maybe you know, about a foot around all the hosta mm -hmm. as well so that, you're, that you are sure you're removing all of that root material because we really don't want to leave just a few of those root fragments in there and then infect next year's hosta. All right, thank you, Kyle. Okay, John, what do we have for our... I was going to ask him, since it's Virus X, will I give you any superpowers? You know, like the X-Men, or... I've you'll, not heard of that one. Oh, you'll become Hosta Man. Okay, I, I don't want that. <laughs> right. Perfect. Right. Okay, John, what do we have? Well, you know, sometimes uh, the samples find you, and so uh, this came into my office this morning. A gentleman stopped in, and he gave... He had these tomatoes in a bucket, and they all look particularly nasty. This is the nicest-looking tomato that he had. But uh, I was a little bit puzzled because we have like all kinds of damage on this tomato. There's like brown and it's mushy uh, and it's soft. And I almost thought, well, you know, we have some diseases that do this like uh, late blight uh, where you'll get damage on the tomato. And he said, well, there are spots on the leaves. I was like, well, that could be late blight. And then I showed him pictures and he said, that's not what it was. So he brought me leaves later in the day. And this is not late blight. So I've sort of passed it around the panel here and we've tried to figure out it is, we don't think it's a disease at all. We actually think that this tomato is roasted. Mm -hmm. uh, so with all the extreme heat that we've had over the last uh, week or so, we get this marginal burning on plant, a lot of plant leaves. We get lots of questions this, when it gets this hot. Uh, about half of the questions I think we get are about sun damage or heat damage. So that's what the leaves are and that's what I think the tomato is, that it is just not a, a very nice roasted tomato. Like, it, you're not gonna put it on pasta or anything. Because <laughs> uh, there were all kinds of bugs that crawled out of one of them. So, uh, yeah, so it is a sun-roasted tomato. Excellent. <laughs> or not. Or not. All right, Dennis, you get the first picture question. Okay. And this is actually a viewer who sent in a picture of a snake from Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And so, it's a North American or yellow belly racer eating a common garter snake. Um, and th that's, the racers are what we call, they do eat other snakes occasionally. They're not a constrictor. Um, and it happens. You gotta remember that even though we're calling both snakes, this isn't cannibalism because those snakes are from different families. One's an egg layer, one gives live birth. So the ge genetics and phylogenetics difference between these two is the same difference between us and a cow. And we don't think it's funny if we eat a cow because we're both mammals. Mm. <laughs> so this is not, not no, really funny. No big deal. It's just normal. <laughs> you gotta remember, just because we think they look different, that's our misfortune. They are different as a primate is to a herbivore. And my guess is the garter snake did not think that was funny. Mm -hmm. No, he didn't. <laughs> All right, so the second picture here came in, uh, let's see, she didn't say from where, but she said, do snakes stay where they shed their skin? Nice to know the hens and chicks could help this one shed. Okay, it's the underside, but it definitely looks like a garter snake. Mm -hmm. The thing to remember when you find a shed skin, which after they go through what we call exodysis, the shed skin is 25 to 33 percent longer than the actual snake because mm. it stretches. Mm -hmm. So if you find a skin that's two foot, 
that snake is probably only 18 inches mm. in length, the actual snake. Um, yeah, they don't really travel very far, so if it's shed there, it probably is living nearby. All right, and your third one here is from Lee, Nebraska. Ah. Found this pretty little guy in the garden. Okay, this is a gray tree frog that's normally gray or green, but it's blue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if it's blue, blue, okay, so what we're, when we see it blue, that means it's reflecting the blue light, not absorbing. So it's an exanthophore, it's a mutation. And so yellow and green make blue, so the yellow is, is missing from the skin. It's very pretty though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I like it. That's pretty cool. Okay, awesome. What is this though? No. <laughs> <laughs> you can eat as many as you want. I don't like them, right? <laughs> okay, Matt, you have some not so pretty things, unfortunately. Uh, the first yeah. one, we, mm -hmm. we do not know where he is from, but planted new turf, still becoming worse, getting worse and worse. Yeah. So, first picture looks like this. Mm -hmm. The second one, I think, is a close up. It mm -hmm. looks like that. Yeah, and planting turf, this looks like fairly new seedlings, actually. Mm -hmm. So, it, we had so much heat last week and the week before. Uh, anytime you're seeding after the date of, let's say, June 15th, it becomes very hard to keep it throughout the summer mm -hmm. unless you're really babying it, fungicides and everything, because those, those seedlings are so weak. And then also, it's, it just gets so dry. Mm -hmm. uh, and even as much water as you're throwing on it, you're actually washing the soil away and then those roots are exposed and it, it just doesn't have a very good root system. And that looked like pretty yeah. crummy soil. Yep, anyway. and the soil had a little gravel in it, so that doesn't yeah. hold much water either. Okay, and you have uh, a Lexington set next, which is this one, and she said, <clears throat> um, she wonders is this grubs or fungus or something else? Yeah, it's it's a brown spot. <laughs> and uh, then I think just, you have a, yeah, yeah a little just closer up there. looking at it, um, I don't know if there is, I mean, there could be a bunch of other things, grubs, but it doesn't really look like it's characteristics of grub damage or, I mean, even disease damage. It mostly looks like localized dry spots. So those might be areas that were compacted, a little bit lower. Uh, and when we had that heat and everything dried out, uh, you start getting these brown spots and they grow almost like a disease, but it's basically just a dry spot that, uh, if it's bluegrass, start watering it, it should resume growth, uh, tall fescue, also, but if it went too far, it might you might have to throw some seed in there. But I've seen a lot of that where uh, you have these even new developments. And sometimes if you probe down in there, there might be rocks or bricks mm -hmm. buried in there in those certain areas. All right, thanks, Matt. Yep. Okay, you have a handful, Kyle, of really not very pretty fruits here. Uh, the first is papillion. Hasn't had any problems with the peach trees over the past several years, but this year, now the suggestion was hail damage. Yeah, no. No, I don't. I don't know <laughs> hail damage that will create that yeah. really kind of almost beautiful gamosis that was on that first picture. So it's just kind of a clear ooze that's coming mm -hmm. out of it, um, and that that clear ooze could be could be a few things. There are some insects that can cause that. So stink bug feeding can can cause similar injury, but um, since it's to the the rotten spot chair, I'm going to go with the diseases. So. Uh, Corineum blight is, is another, um, another, it's a fungal pathogen that hits a lot of our stone fruits. Um, and especially when you've had, um, when you have kind of a cooler, wet spring like we had, that fungus can become much more active. Another thing that this fungus does is it causes lesions on the leaves. And as the lesions, um, as the lesions mature, the centers drop out. And so that kind of tells me we do have corineum blight because the leaves here do have a lot of those kind of shot holes, shot holes in them. And then it does, yeah, produces this gamosis or this clear ooze that comes out, comes out the front or it comes out, it comes out of the peach. As far as management, um, this is really going to be one of those where you'll want to increase airflow through the canopy um, to increase leaf drying and things like that. We typically don't recommend fungicides in a homeowner situation, but this, this fungus will overwinter on the, on the infected twigs. So when the tree has gone dormant, you can go and look for any cankers on those twigs, and maybe do some pruning. All right, you have actually a, a Holdridge viewer for your third one who has, um, this is apricots. Okay. So, and, and they do spray, but he says the rain or 
or he neglects the actual spray schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, this is scab. Um, very common on, on a, lot of our, a lot of our fruits. We'll get apples get scab, peaches, apricots as well. The nice thing about scab is it's primarily a cosmetic disease. And so if you're planning on processing those, if you peel them, um, the fruit underneath should be just fine. And you can even eat scabby apricots as well. I, I do fairly often. They're, they're quite tasty and they're a lot cheaper than the healthy ones. <laughs> <laughs> but scab can be difficult to control with fungicides because that, that scab spore, once it lands on the fruit, it's going to take over five to six weeks to actually cause those symptoms that we were mm. seeing there. So if you were spraying this fungicide, you want to make sure that you're out there really early in the spring, um, kind of right as those fruits are starting to, um, starting to, uh, starting to be produced that's the time to do the fungicide application. All right, thanks. Scabby Brian. apricot just doesn't sound as appetizing no. as you make it out to be. No, <laughs> it's, it's probably my least, uh, my least selling jam. Okay. <laughs> All right, you have some fruits too, John. The first here is from Gretna and he has a raspberry patch, six years old, um, did the right thing, it sounds like, filled in well, but the last few years he's not really gotten a lot of berries. So he's, is this a fertilization, is it a thinning, or is it pollination, or all of those? So there are a few things that can happen. So there are some, there's one or two diseases that will do this. So there's an anthracnose that you can get on fruit that will do this. Uh, but I sort of looked a little closer at this picture and it looked to me like the flowers were never fertilized because mm -hmm. it looked like the flower structures will still were still there. They were just dried out. So I think it's probably a bit of a pollination problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that can arise from a few different things. So it could be that you don't have enough bees in the area to pollinate. They are bee pollinated. Um, however, it could also be that while they're in flower and they're in flower for a short period that they need to be pollinated, it could have been raining too much and the bees weren't out working or it could have been too hot and the pollen was sterile. So there's lots of different things, but I think it's a, a, a pollination issue to me. All right, and your second one is actually a viewer who is in Shelton and um, they didn't know what it was and whether the fruit is safe and they do look like tiny apricots. So what do we think happened So here? yeah, they were asking, are they tiny apricots? And indeed they are tiny apricots. Um, so one thing that happens um, with fruit, uh, fruit trees is that pruning really helps with fruit size and quality. Mm -hmm. uh, and s they said that they had moved into this house and they, they didn't know what it was. And so it's probably not been pruned in several years. So the bigger the tree mass is, the more energy it puts into uh, the tree and less into fruit development. And also the less you prune it, the more fruit it develops. And the more fruit you have, the less energy it has into to developing the fruit. So getting some good pruning on that tree will make them not teeny weeny <laughs> apricots. They will be, you know, bigger apricots and hopefully not scabby apricots. Hopefully exactly. not scabby. Yes. Exactly. All right. Thanks, guys. Well, for our first feature tonight, we're going to hear from John about telling the difference between tomato diseases, insect damage, or environmental issues. Here's part four of John's series on growing tomatoes the right way. Oh, hey there neighbor, how's it going today? I'm just out here taking a look at my tomatoes to make sure I don't have any diseases or insects, but I could use your help, so why don't you come on up here because you can't see from way down there. To grow the best tomatoes, you have to know if there are any issues going on, and to figure that out, you have to get up close and personal and take a close look. Like, are you having an environmental issue? Too much water, too little water, too much or too little fertility? Is it a disease like fungus or a virus? Is it an insect or is it another issue? You have to get up close and take a look to see what's going on. For example, I saw some wilting leaves on my tomatoes, got up close and personal, and found that they had spider mites. So I did a spider mite treatment and they're doing much better now. And we can do the same for your garden. We just have to get up and take a closer look and figure out what's going on. In our short time together, I'm not gonna be able to tell you every disease and how to treat it, but I can give you some general guidelines for the basic problems of tomatoes and start you down the path of treatment. In general, the most common thing you'll find on tomatoes are fungal diseases. 
and you see those in a lot of spots. We have septoria leaf spot and black spot. We have early blights and late blights and all those things. The most common thing you'll see are the spots on those and each spot has a different symptom so you can help diagnose those and you can get help diagnosing those if you need. But you want to start off by removing all the affected leaves because those help it spread. So you want to remove all of the signs of disease and then start some sort of treatment. You can use an organic like copper or you can use something called Serenade, which is a new product that's bacteria based that helps disease sp from spreading. You're not going to cure the disease. Your goal is to help keep it from spreading to the rest of the plant. For insects, you look for signs of damage like missing plant parts, holes in leaves, or even some of the sap sucking insects, you'll have brown spots where they're feeding. Or of course, if you see the insect there, you know what's going on and you wanna do some sort of treatment. So an organic treatment for a caterpillar like pest, like the tomato hornworm would be BT, or you can use something general for all insects. We have pyrethrum and pyrethroids. Uh, we also have something that is called spinosad, which is a newer product on the market that helps with a wide variety of insects, and it's also organic. That's what I use to treat my flea beetles. There are also environmental issues that can affect your tomatoes that aren't caused by a disease or an insect, but by things like too much or too little rain, which causes root damage and you get wilting, or you can also get that blossom end rot that we've talked about with the damage on the bottom of tomatoes. You can also get sun scald, which will discolor your tomatoes. There's all kinds of different things that will affect tomatoes, so it can be a little bit confusing. So the take home lesson today is that we've got to get up close and personal and take a look at those tomatoes to see exactly what's going on because we wanna know what's going on so we can have the most effective treatment. And that can be daunting sometimes, so you need to call Backyard Farmer or consult your local extension office. That's fine, they can help you diagnose those problems and offer treatment. You can't really make effective treatments if you don't know what you're looking at, so proper identification of the problem is absolutely the first step to keep those plants healthy throughout the season, and that is true of every plant. Okay, this, your, your next one, Dennis, is from Ogallala. And uh, you've got a couple pictures here, I think, of some, some holes. <laughs> so oh, yeah. first pick here, and then the second one might be a little closer up, as I recall. Okay, these aren't holes, these are mounds, and these okay. are the Plains Pocket Gopher. Um, and Pocket Gophers make a lot of holes. And actually, their tunnel is not underneath those, it's to the side. You can use a bait on these guys. Uh, the ZP Ag Bait works if there's a larger area. Or you can trap them using a Maccabee trap. And all this is in, uh, if you go to wildlife.unl.edu, a whole manual on how to take care of the Plains Pocket Gopher. All right, and your, your next one is also a mound. Right. And this is three mounds showed up one per day, six to eight inches high, one to two feet in diameter, and this is in Omaha. Right, so this, is a molehill, and we don't want to make you know a molehill out of a plain pocket gopher mound, so they're different. <laughs> um, <laughs> so this you can't use a bait. Uh, you can, you have to use the gummy worm type bait, or you can use the harpoon mole trap. So one's a herbivore, the plain pocket gopher, and this one is a carnivore, only mainly only eating earthworms, not grubs, earthworms. Um, so go ahead, there's plenty of products on the market that look like worms that are the, probably the best way if you want to go with a bait. All right, thank you, Dennis. Um, okay, Matt, this is a McClelland, Iowa viewer, so east of Council Bluffs. She has a, a turf sort of thing growing along, or she thinks it's turf, yeah. along the edges of her mowed paths. Uh, is it desirable or not? What is it? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, I looked at it pretty closely and I was trying to pinpoint exactly what it is. It looks to me a lot like smooth brome grass, but it's like smooth brome grass on steroids because the leaves, there's a ton of them on top. So or is I'm it not, a sedge? I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's a sedge, but because the, the base of it has kind of a round stem and it's growing up, so it's kind of spreading out. It almost looks like a reed canary grass or something like that, but mm. does anybody else have any... All I know is, I, is that sedges have edges and rushes around and grasses have leaves that go all the way there down. There you go. That's, so, that's a good one. <laughs> so that's you know, so the only thing if, I know about grass. <laughs> if, if, it's a, if it's a small area and it's spreading, uh, what you can do is when it's young is treat it with glyphosate because that would take care of any type of grass. And it works pretty well. And if it comes back the next year, you want to repeat it because it's, it's most likely something that's going to start growing bigger and bigger mm -hmm. every year like a, some sort of 
canary grass or even an ornamental could be some type of ornamental grass that I I can't pinpoint exactly. All right, maybe she could send us a picture yeah. of the whole clump. Yep, a yeah. sample of it would help too. Yeah. All Thanks. right, thank you, Matt. Okay, you, this is a uh, extreme South Dakota, Southeast South Dakota question, Kyle, and it's um, lots and lots of evergreens that look like this. So brown pines, she says she did remove one a number of years ago that had pine borers in it of some sort, mm -hmm. but but what do we think is going on here? Um, yeah, I th there could be a, a lot of things going on with this one. Um, as, you know, some of the needles, um, some of the last year's needles that we can see here, there are some kind of red bands on them or brown spots. So it could, looks like it may have a, either Dothostroma needle blight or perhaps um, brown spot of pine is another, another one that it could have been. However, neither of those diseases really kill needles as they're new as they're emerging this year and so seeing the seeing the dead needles on that last picture really makes me wonder if there's not something a little bit deeper going on it's been it's been one heck of a year um, weather wise we had too much heat too much cold too much rain and I really think just the combination of those environmental factors are kind of leading to overall tree decline unfortunately all right thank you Kyle Okay, you have, uh, first off, a cucumber question. A cucumber. Uh, this is uh, in Papillion. He planted some straight eights and um, another couple seeds. And one is growing these, same texture as cukes, little spiky things. He's wondering what he's got on, on this particular, what he thought was straight eight, which is clearly the eight ball instead. <laughs> So we have a case of cucumber mistaken identity. Mm -hmm. uh, so where we got them, there were some, another variety mixed in. And this is actually a, there's nothing wrong with these cucumbers. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the question was leading to that. Mm -hmm. This is a lemon cucumber. It's a cultivar of cucumbers. They're really neat. Um, they, they are cucumbers, but they sort of look like lemons. Uh, and the neat thing is that people grow these that like to do canning and pickles because when you slice the top and bottom, it's almost like a column. So you can like stack them up in the canning jars. You can just like have a stack of pickles in the jar. Mm. So they're really fun. It's a lemon cucumber. All right, and then you have a couple of questions here that are uh, ones from Riverton to begin with. She has grown both soft neck and hard neck garlic. Uh, this year the hardneck grew some little small nodules on the sides. She wonders if these are seedlings on this one. Uh, yeah, so the bulbs will, will reproduce and they'll have different, different ways to do that. And so they will produce what are called bulbils. So there are some that will grow on the, the base. And so that's what this is. So you can plant them. It'll take a little while. They won't be like full size garlic next year, but they'll take a little while. Okay, and then we have another garlic question from North Platte. Just harvested and noticed that they had small bulbs in the ground, like a normal little red bulb structure, both underground and above. And he sent some pretty good pictures. So what's this and what caused that? So garlic and onions will also form bulbils uh, on their scapes. So at certain points in their development, they will send up what looks like a bloom. Uh, mm -hmm. And there will be little bulbs that form on those and you can plant those as well. What happened here is for some reason the scape did not uh, elongate and come out of the top. It just stayed in the neck of the garlic. And so uh, when he dug them up, that's what you find. So it's, they just didn't come out of the ground. So is that plantable, edible, or just a curiosity? I wouldn't, there wouldn't be edible. They're sort of like hard little grainy things, but you can plant them. It'll just take a, a year or two for them to grow into edible garlic size. All right, excellent. Well, you know, the hotter weather has calmed down a bit here in eastern Nebraska, and we're already starting to plan a fall garden. Let's take a few minutes to hear from Terry James out at the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we are getting ready to start that transition between summer and fall vegetable growing. We've harvested a lot of our stuff. We're seeing, as we've said in the past, the damage from the squash vine borer and the squash beetles. So we're pulling some of those squash out. Um, so we have some holes. All of our cabbage is pretty much um, done for for the season. So all of that has come out. Broccoli, all those cool season things. 
So we're really looking forward to starting our fall garden. So as we've talked in the past, over the past years, we're examining when our frost dates are across the state. We're counting those dates back on the back of the seed packet to see when we need to get those planted. We're hitting about the 1st of August. So across most of the state, some of those shorter term radishes, lettuces, um, some of the zucchinis can all start going in for a second um, flush of plants and harvest for the season. Um, we're looking at a lot of flowers and lots of pollinators in our garden, so we're really happy about that. If you're in Lincoln, stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out what's growing here. And you too can easily plan to plant that fall garden as your other vegetables are really getting ready for harvest. It's a great way to extend the season, make the best use of that space and keep eating those fresh things. Four, six. Get those in and while you are doing that, we will see who wins the lightning round. That eggplant picture, by the way, was sent in by one of our viewers with the, with the nose. <laughs> All right, are you ready, John? I'm ready. We have several people who are wondering, can they cut their daylily foliage and the spent blooms off to the ground right now? Uh, spent blooms, yes, wait on the foliage until it starts to die back naturally. All right, this is a Juniata viewer. They have bags of cypress mulch and wonder, can they keep that in the shed or the garage over the winter? Yes, as long as you don't get, uh, get it wet, it shouldn't sort of start breaking down and you don't want to, to let rodents get in there, so. All right. Uh, is it okay to use Epsom salts on peppers? Only if you know that you have a magnesium or sulfur deficiency as indicated by a soil test. <laughs> Perfect. Can a bearded iris be transplanted now? Uh, I would wait until they start dying back. All right. Uh, this is an East of Woodbine, Iowa viewer. Recently planted a yellow delicious apple and it dropped its leaves. Will it relief? Uh, that's a wait and see, so you'll have to wait and see what happens in the future. All right, uh, this is a two inch diameter crab, three years old, has a three foot long crack in the trunk. Will that hurt the tree? Sounds like it, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. All right, thank you. Nice job. Are you ready, Kyle? Always. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> okay. <Thanks. laughs> so this is a viewer that has Jacob Klein bee balm, which is the big red one, and the leaves are all of a sudden turning white. This is in Omaha. Powdery mildew. And can do what about it? Uh, you can just prune to increase airflow through there is gonna be the big thing. All right, that was two questions. Yes. So this is a Concord viewer who has a small zucchini that have rotten ends. What is that? That's probably blossom end rot. That's not a pathogen. Um, that's likely caused by, um, in, uh, by having uneven watering and a slight calcium deficiency. All right, can fusarium cause the stems of peonies to collapse? Probably, fusarium can do most things. Most bad things. Yes, most bad things. Okay, so uh, this is a viewer that wonders if he can apply a granular fungicide with 51% propiconazole to his tomatoes in the spring or fall to avoid blight. Uh, yeah, that should work. Just make sure to water it in really well. All right. A bag of miracle Grow had some sort of fungus growing in it. Will it be okay? I would avoid using it. Okay, nice job. Okay, Matt. Yeah. You ready? Get seven, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is a viewer who uh, says their neighbor plugged some buffalo grass just this week. How often does that need the plugs need to be watered? Uh, they just need to be kept moist, so you don't have to drown them every time. Just keep them wet. All right. Um, is the seeding window in Nebraska, in northeast Nebraska, backed up a little bit since they are about three weeks behind southern Nebraska? Um, I would say they're pretty similar every year. I mean, it all depends on the weather patterns and they change quick, so still stick with those same patterns. All right. This is a Norfolk viewer who wants to know whether they can till without first killing the turf and weeds that are there and expect good success. So they don't want to use a herbicide. Yes, if you till it up good and it's dry, it'll die. If it's wet right after you till it, some of those might regrow. All right, this is an Oakland viewer who wants to know whether they can plug their zoysia lawn in the summer heat. 
I would say yes, but you're going to have to go with a little bit deeper plugs. That way you're getting some more roots. Okay, this is a Bertrand viewer who wants to know what is the best way to kill clover in the um, I would say there's quite a few products. Any containing quinclorac work really well on clover. Um, triclopyr, clopyrrolid, anything with those three in them work really well. Okay, or thicken that lawn. Yeah, or thicken the lawn. <laughs> okay, you ready? Yeah, I'm always ready. Mm -hmm. You're always ready. Okay, this is a Takema viewer who wants to know the difference between bat poop and mouse poop. Bat poop is very sparkly because it's got exoskeletons in, in it, and uh, mouse poop is not sparkly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is an Omaha viewer who wants to know how deep do groundhogs excavate? They'll go 20 foot into a bank and easily three or four foot deep. All right. This is a Lee Nebraska viewer who found a little black snake underground. What would that be? Probably a ring neck in that area. All right. Eats uh, ant eggs. Ant eggs. Okay. This is a Whiting, Iowa viewer who wants to know, is there a way to deter rabbits from eating her potted plants? A good fence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what sort of fill deters, deters groundhogs? Uh, lava rock. Pack it in there really good. They can't move it and it cuts them up. Okay. Are there any particular birds that eat Japanese beetles? Not that I know of, um, but chickens eat about anything, so maybe chickens or guineas. <laughs> Neither of which probably are generally roosting in the trees. Right, and so... Get a bunch <laughs> of them. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, what do we have for Plants of the Week this week? Uh, so we have a few different plants. So we have uh, Prairie Blazing Star, so that's this nice uh, tall one here. So it'll grow up to five feet tall. It's great for pollinators. Uh, has a very uh, long uh, season of flowering, um, but uh, voles love it. <laughs> so if you want to feed the voles, you know, mm -hmm. like Dennis might grow it, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, we also have balloon flower, so it's named for its buds. So you see these interesting uh, little uh, buds here. Um, and it has a nice deep root system, uh, has lots of different colors. This one's sort of a purpley blue, but it can be pink or white. Uh, and there's short ones, tall ones, double ones. There's all different kinds of ones. And then I snuck in one. Uh, so this is a plant called Malabar spinach. Uh, and it's native to uh, the, the Indian subcontinent, but we can actually grow it as an edible, but it's also very beautiful as well. Um, and it is a spinach substitute. It's too hot now to grow spinach, uh, but it uh, really tastes like spinach and it's used to make different Indian dishes or different salads. The only thing you have to watch out for is if you only cook it lightly, it does the same thing as okra and it's called, mu it's mucilaginous. So basically, it turns into phlegm. Uh, so you don't want to only lightly cook it, only eat it raw, or cook it a lot. All right. <laughs> Thanks, John. And by the way, oh, of course, yeah, it does go. taste really good, and yeah. it's very beautiful. All of those are in the backyard farmer garden. Yeah. So people can come right. visit us and, and see the, the beauty in the garden. All right. Next set of pictures, Dennis, is oh, yours. I'm going to eat. You can, well, you can. <laughs> We're hungry. We'll it's save you a leaf. Okay, yeah. <laughs> So let's see, the first one here is a Holdridge viewer, and they saw four owls in their maple tree. Two they think were babies, and the third was maybe a, parent, a horned owl parent. What do you think? Are those horned owls? They look like great horned owl uh, juveniles. I'm not the best with the juvenile birds, but I would say easily could be a great horned owl juvenile. Especially if oh, there's definitely there's the adult great horn. Right, owl. and that one's in Sutton. So oh. uh, they saw four little owls in their backyard, and they were wondering if anybody could tell them what they are. Yep. Will they stay? I mean, or do or, or do the great horns? Migrate? They they will stay for a while. Um, it depends on the resources. As long as there's no big predators on them, and um, and there's plenty of voles for them to eat, and little tiny things like that. You know, small rabbits they'll stay. All right, perfect. What is the sound they make? I can't do that. I do frog calls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do a frog call. <laughs> All right, are you ready, Matt? Yep. That's... Uh, this is a viewer in Shenandoah, Iowa, and she found this strange weed growing in her dill. She couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, leaves have little spines. It's about 10 inches tall, and I think she gave us a picture also, maybe of the flowers. Yeah, there's a, I mean, it's a pretty good picture, and then there yeah. was one that was a little closer up, but 
Yeah. It took me a while to figure this one out because I've never seen it either. It's actually a safflower. Oh. And it is actually grown commercially. And mm -hmm. what they do is they harvest the seeds out of them and they get the oil out of them. Mm -hmm. There was actually some research done here in Nebraska many years ago and they increased the oil production. So now it's grown mostly in South Dakota. California, I think, grows most of it. But it's a, it's a high dollar oil if you want to buy it. Or it's bird seed. It's I'll bird bet seed. that's where yeah. it came from. Yeah. I'll bet that's where yeah. it came from. It could be in bird seed. Okay, and then you have also another a weed, and this is a northeast Nebraska viewer. She's done a couple of pictures. Yeah, this one is pretty common in shaded areas or pretty much anywhere there where there's thin, mm -hmm. thin soil exposed. It's a water pod, mm -hmm. and this one is very easy to pull out because it really has a shallow taproot. Um, and it has those little balls on them, green, or they turn kind of black. Uh, and those are the seeds. So uh, same with those, pull them out and get rid of them. That way you're not leaving the seed there. So if you pull them and drop them, those seeds are going to be there for next year. So just get rid of them. All right. Thank you, Matt. Yep. Okay. This is a Bellevue viewer uh, ha having problems with peonies. Okay. So he says he thinks they have multiple problems, some mildew, but some of the leaves are lighter colored. He did notice the problem with the leaves in late May or early June, and he's got a picture of the whole the whole beautiful row there, and I think he has a close-up picture, too, of the foliage. Yeah, so there, there are a few different fungal diseases going on here. The, the, the leaves that have kind of that white growth on them, that's powdery mildew, everyone's favorite high humidity fungus, um, primarily superficial. Um, uh, and just cosmetic damage due to the powdery mildew. However, repeated years of, infest, of, of infections can damage the plant. The other leaf spot there, the one that has, uh, is kind of the, has the more reddish, um, reddish lesions, I think that's a cladosporium leaf spot. And so just another, another fungal pathogen, really not much to be, to be too concerned about unless you have a lot of peonies all right next to each other, kind of like, kind of like, like yes. was in, on this picture. So, yeah, both of those fungi can easily spread through some of these large plantings. So, one of the big things for um, for this would be moisture management. So, making sure that you, if you are watering them, maybe do a, something like a drip irrigation, so we're not having that above ground, that above ground moisture or above watering from above the plant. The other thing would just be increasing airflow through the canopy. So doing some selective pruning, um, clean up some of those um, those spotty leaves, and you'll take care of the sanitation. The other big thing for both of these will be in the fall to go and make sure, if, especially especially if the plants are severely infected, make sure to, to remove the above ground um, tissue, and that will remove a lot of the disease pressure for next year too. All right, excellent, thanks Kyle. All right, this, this is a one that you will bat to Matt maybe a little bit here, mm -hmm. but this is a viewer who, um, she, she said she thought she saw variegation in her son's garden, and she sent three pictures. The first is a tomato. Uh, the second, I believe, is a grass. Yes, she's even labeled them, which is great. And the third one is a hydrangea. And so, John, initially you thought what, and then in conversation we figured out what. Uh, so sometimes plants do weird things genetically, and you'll have these what we call sports. So it'll, the, you'll have something weird growing off the side that is not like the parent plant, and sometimes that sport is a, they lose the ability to produce chlorophyll, so they're no longer green, and we see variegation happen all, all the time like that. And I f first thought, well, that's a really neat tomato. And then I looked at the other pictures. It's like, that wouldn't happen to all of these things all at once in the same mm -hmm. place. So I think what we have here, would we could label as chemically induced variegation. <laughs> uh, and it's probably herbicide damage. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one that is prob a likely culprit called tenacity. Mm -hmm. uh, but all of that chemistry is more in, in Matt's uh, yeah. area of expertise so yeah I think you're right I mean if it's if something was applied there that had those chemicals in it it's it, it's a likely culprit unless you have a very odd instance where they all have that bleach yeah I mean that would be well, unless you have uh, like something radioactive going on or you know something to cause all those <laughs> mutations probably not yeah um, and so it can be there's some some lawn products uh, that can have that in there or the tenacity is a spray uh, does it volatilize any? No, it's pretty much once you spray it on, it's 
<clears throat> in the soil, but if it was sprayed right next to it, it could absorb it through the roots. So okay. that would be one instance of how that works, I guess. All or, right, and then you have a fourth picture, actually, John, and this is also <clears throat> a hydrangea. Uh, totally different, really, in this instance. It's nine years old, it's bloomed every year, uh, but not blooming much. So what do you think we have? going on here. So you see that whiteness on those leaves and that is totally different and I think that is actually um, some sun scald heat damage so it's it's sort of like just bleaching out the leaves so mm -hmm. I don't think that's herbicide damage or you know it's nothing else other than just the sun and the bleaching out. Okay or nutrition maybe in that one spot. It could be nutrition you know. But you never know. Yeah but you never know. All right good. Well, you know, a few weeks ago, a raging downpour caused severe flooding in the Kearney area and the surrounding spaces. We met up with Dan Lillis and Alan Rossler with the city of Kearney to hear what happened and how the landscape plants and trees are recovering. Well, some of the concerns were the, uh, the amount, the rate at which the water was draining. Uh, well, when you get six inches of rain in a three and a half hour span, it's going to take a lot longer to drain than it does for a regular rain event. Uh, so the, it revealed that the pipes were not clogged. Uh, if the pipes in the city's stormwater conveyance system were clogged, we would have gotten a lot of calls about standing water after the event in non-flooded areas, and we did not get any. Probably the most significant damage was in places where there was actually rapidly flowing high volumes of water that actually disrupted uh, root zones or mulch beds or, or tore things right out of the ground. Uh, fortunately, that was in a limited number of locations and it was a lot of more native locations where those plants may have not been planted by anyone on purpose anyway, so the, the damage to them was not as bad as if it would have been more formally planted areas that were affected and in general those were not impacted as much because they just saw rising water levels and then receding water levels a few days later they didn't see the high flows that that some of the more natural areas did. The longer term drowning like effects would be from the loss of gas exchange in the root zones and most of the areas that flooded have a sand and gravel sub base so the water rose and then it went back down fairly quickly and so there wasn't a prolonged period of, of uh, having that gas exchange disrupted. So I think the plant health is for the most part going to be not that much uh, of a reaction one way or the other to it. A number of built features were probably worse casualties than our plants. Plants are very resilient. Uh, but. Floodwaters are very powerful when you see a number of eight foot by eight foot by six inch thick sections of trail just lifted and floated and moved around. That, that makes you aware of how much uh, actual force was exerted by that flowing water. Um, and fairly adjacent to those, you could see trees that were able to withstand those floods. So that kind of illustrates the resilience of nature versus some of our man-made items, uh, just like the retaining wall that that is just down the line from here that uh, been there since the 30s, but a big chunk, a chunk of it failed during this event because of the incredible volume of water and the, and the force that that applies. Well, I would say yes, I'm satisfied with the way the system is working. I, I was out in the field the last few weeks after the storm to uh, look into pipes with a pole camera to verify they're not clogged, to verify the status is you know, that they're still draining. And the, the places, like I mentioned earlier, they had a uh, you know, slower drainage because of the volume of water. If it was a regular event, it would, you wouldn't have noticed it. But because six inches of rain happened in a three and a half hour period of time, that's a, it, I've, been, I've been told it's equivalent to a 500 year flood. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied with our stormwater system. The good news is the flooding problems didn't last too long and a lot of that plant material didn't suffer too much being underwater for kind of a short time. Next time we'll be hearing from Gary Zimmer, who is the curator of the Gilman Arboretum in Pierce, about how that park is recovering after the historic floods. So they've had some other issues to deal with. All right, Dennis, uh, more holes in the yard. Okay. And this one is, any idea what is causing this? She sent a couple of different pictures here. so it's. Kind of like one big old hole. Yeah, that lo looks like a rabbit making a form. Okay. Rabbits make a form about six inches deep. 
Oh, this looks more like a squirrel <laughs> burying his nuts. So one of or each, digging maybe. Up his nuts. Yeah, yeah. They're, not, they're not the same. Yeah. Are they the same? Same picture? person. Same yeah. person. Yeah. yeah. Different. Or this might have been the, the rabbit starting and deciding yeah. that I don't want to give birth here. I want to go down the street or mm. to the next turf area. Because they do do that with the with the yep. turf, don't right. they? Yeah. All right. All right. So that was pretty simple. Just yeah. fill it in and hope the rabbit yep. got eaten by the fox. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> you have a, a question here about a turf that's lying flat. This is actually up in Omaha. And so it's really kind of strange. It's, it's uh, in the backyard. It's a four by four area. It's tall fescue. All of a sudden, after the three inch rain, it was lying flat. But before that, it was also showing these weird symptoms. He mows at a, you know, a standard height. Yeah. He doesn't see any, any uh, fungal spores in the blades. Yeah. And I think we have a picture, maybe a close up of that too. I know, that's right. I'm, I looked at him pretty close and it almost looks like you have a different type of grass growing mm -hmm. in your tall fescue. Mm -hmm. um, and it's most likely rough bluegrass if that's what's happening. Because that one, once the heat comes and humidity, it likes to lay flat and actually turn brown. It just dies. And it, it spreads by stone. So if you were to rake that area up, it would almost come up as like a fluff. And that would be one telltale sign that it's probably rough bluegrass. Mm -hmm. And it won't be dead. It'll be there next year, next spring. It'll regrow because it'll have stones that survive even though they look dead. Uh, so the, your best bet would be to try and kind of get as much out as possible and seed some tall fescue there this fall so it can compete or outcompete the rough bluegrass. All right, thanks, Matt. Okay, you have a couple spotty things here, Kyle. The first right. one is actually a hyacinth bean, uh, looking like that. Yeah, um, this one I think that this one is another environmental issue, um, potentially nutritional, or it could be could, uh, could be due to just the extreme heat and sun that we've had. But pretty pretty uniform on all the leaves. Doesn't really look um, doesn't look diseased. So I would just let it be. All right, and your second one is a papillion viewer. What are these spots on the peppers and on only two of the eight plants? Uh, sunburned peppers. Oh. Um, so similar, just like people, mm -hmm. peppers and fruit get sunburns as well, um, sun scald. So it's just the, um, the extreme heat that we've had and, the, and the, just the heavy sun can cause that, cause that kind of white leathery growth on the peppers. They're typically fine to eat. However, you do want to be careful if you do have sun scald because that can provide an infection court for any sort of fungal or bacterial disease too. So, but otherwise, if the peppers, if the peppers are otherwise clean, I would eat them. All right, excellent, thank you. All right, you have uh, another couple of tomato questions here, John. This is a trainer Iowa viewer who has uh, yellow leaves on their patio tomatoes, which they've never grown before. What do we think this one is? Uh, so if, if you're getting yellowing leaves, there can be a few things. So uh, if it's just yellowing, it could be a nutrition deficiency. Uh, and then patio tomatoes, you know, you only have that limited amount of potting soil. So that could be uh, nitrogen. Uh, and it could manifest also from diseases. So if you see some brown spots on there, uh, there could be maybe a fungal disease going on. Okay, and did we blow this one up and find a critter? Yes, so what, we, <laughs> so what I did was I sort of zoomed in and if you see uh, the edges of those leaves, that, those are spider mites. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we, what we have here is that brown damage is coming from the spider mites. So the yellowing leaves could be from spider mites or also the nutritional damage or the nutritional um, issue, but it could also be from that, that spider mite feeding. And you can see some webs down there with little dead spider mite bodies in them as well, so. All right, and I, you have another picture. This is actually a papillion viewer. Has a Biltmore, which is three feet tall, and a six foot, which is an early girl. Uh, his question was really whether he was giving them too much water, uh, and a quick answer on this one, 12 gallons. That, fine. yeah, that is fine. And, you know, they're very healthy looking plants. Early girl is uh, indeterminate, so it will just keep growing. Uh, the one thing, I don't see a lot of fruit or flowers up on the top part of the plant, so it could be too much nitrogen, which will give you lush green growth, but not a lot of fruiting. All right, excellent. Well, you know, announcements of good things in the gardening world. The, the, uh, the one that we are announcing, of course, is Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. Facebook, Sundays, 6.30 p.m and you can follow us and it'll be a really good one about trees this time. So urban, urban forest, urban trees, that'll be fun to watch.